Good morning, class. Uh, I want to welcome you to our very first screencast of the year. So hopefully you guys had a nice, relaxing summer. You're done with your summer reading assignment. And because really, you know, for us, the year starts now. Uh, and so before you watch these things, you, you should read chapter one. So if you haven't read chapter one, stop now, you should go back and read it. If you have read it, um, basically to kind of give you an idea of what these screen tests are. They're, they're video lectures, and um, we're going to be using them throughout the year to kind of add lessons on uh, to a week or during the year to kind of pick up extra lessons to add an extra material for you guys um, that if we were just using class time, we would not be able to do. And so that's really kind of a tool that me and Mr. Dumpy are going to try and use throughout the year uh, to really kind of accelerate uh, the curriculum. Um, so before we get started, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mr. Palladino. Uh, and for a lot of you, I'm going to be your teacher this year. For those of you who don't have me, you'll have Mr. Dumpy. Um, so we're just going to kind of jump right into it. And for you guys, what you should do is kind of treat it just like class. Um, copy the aim, copy down the three major points, and we're going to kind of run through them. Um, it should be about 15 minutes long or so, and if you kind of extend over, there might be a, a little bit of an extension time. Uh, onto the back end of the screen desk. Um, so what we're going to start with really is European society uh, and kind of what was Europe like before the Europeans come to the Americas? Because what we really have to understand is what was Europe like, what were the Americas like, what was Africa like, because the three worlds are going to collide. And we're going to specifically focus on them colliding here in North America. So we're going to focus on first the role of Christianity. because. Christianity plays, you know, a huge role in European society and kind of the fundamentals of European society. So we're going to take a step further back in history, really back for you guys to ninth grade. Um, so what we're going to look at first is kind of what was Christianity like in Europe. And so to get, to get a good idea of this, I like this quote because it really kind of shows you how powerful Christianity was and how influential Christianity was in every aspect of Europe. Um, and so really what they're doing here is they're comparing the Pope to Caesar, to, to the Roman emperors here, because the comparison is very valid. European Popes had almost as much power, more power than, than Roman emperors did before them. Um, so why do they make this comparison? Well, when the Roman Empire collapsed, what you're looking at here is you know, that classic map of all of the different tribes invading the, the Western Roman Empire. So this happens about 500 AD or so. Um, so you have the Huns, the Vandals, the Visigoths, they're all invading and Western Roman Empire collapses. The Eastern Roman Empire we know does not collapse, it becomes the Byzantine Empire, but the West collapses. Now, when the West collapses, it's really chaos there for a while. Um, and the new system that's going to develop, the new political system that develops is going to be feudalism. But Really the thing that's unifying all of European society together is not the political system, it's Christianity. That becomes the unifying force. So Christianity takes the place of the Roman Empire, of what the Caesar used to do, of what the, you know, the Roman legion used to do to kind of coalesce and kind of uh, create some kind of unity in Europe. So Christianity becomes a big unifying factor. And if you look here, kind of as the Roman Empire collapses, Christianity starts to spread, and it becomes more and more powerful and more and more influential. So we're really going to focus on Western Europe. Now, at this time, when the Roman Empire collapses, and throughout the feudal period, which is about 500 AD to roughly like 1200, 1300 AD, uh, Christianity is one unified group in Western Europe. Western and Eastern Christianity divide in a, around 900 with the Great Schism. But Western Europe, they're all together for you know, the same Christianity. So don't think Roman Catholic Church, it doesn't exist quite yet, um, but it will. And when this division takes place really is with Martin Luther and his 95 Theses in 1517. So this is a major event for, uh, for Europe. Um, because what happens here, after Martin Luther kind of spells out his grievances, um, and we know a lot of his grievances, you know, his big one was the sale of indulgences um, by the Catholic Church. But he's upset with the corruption overall in the Catholic Church and what's going on in European Christianity. Now, 
unbeknownst to Luther at the time, when he does this, he sets off a whole chain reaction of uh, other people who are upset with the church, and he ends up getting a lot of followers. Um, and so him and the church, they can't get along. And what ends up happening is that large numbers of Europeans are going to break away from the Catholic Church. Now, they're not going to break away from the Catholic Church and have no church at all. What they're going to do is they're going to break away and form their own churches here. So this is kind of a map of Europe, say, circa 1500 about. Um, and this is really when we're going to kind of jump into our class a little bit, like late 1500s, early 1600s. And what you should notice here, the purple areas, that's going to be Protestantism. Um, so Northern Europe really kind of breaks away from the Catholic Church, and Southern Europe really remains, and West, a lot of Western Europe remains Catholic. Um, so this is very important for us to kind of understand. You have other people who kind of get involved with this. You have Erasmus, you have King Henry VIII, the English who are going to break away. But it's important for us to understand because, um, for two reasons. Number one, what you have to understand here is that the Europeans are extremely religious. You know, Christianity is very important to them. Two, they're also very divided at the time. You have, depending on the country, you have a majority, either Protestant or a majority Catholic. And so that's going to kind of influence these settlers that come from these countries to the New World. So we're predominantly going to be focusing on English settlers, um, and they're going to be made up of the Anglican Church. Uh, but you know, you have settlers come to the New World and to what becomes the United States from all over the world. And so their individual experiences in their own countries are going to play a huge role when they come to the New World. Uh, and so it's not really kind of, don't think of it kind of as, well, the North becomes Protestant and the South remains Catholic and they kind of both kind of agree to disagree and they kind of go on their way. That is not what it's like at all. Um, when they divide, you have minority groups. So let's say, take England, for example. You have many minority groups. You have Catholics, you have, um, you know, you have other versions of Protestantism, you have Calvinists, Lutherans. These people are not going to be treated very well in these countries. What you're going to have here is tons of religious turmoil. You have religious wars that are going to plague Europe for 200, 300 years of wars that take place. And they're going to have a direct impact on American society. Um, so these people are extremely religious, and they are very unaccepting of other viewpoints, to the point of they'll fight wars over this. Uh, and what happens here is that you have religion that's intertwined with the government. There is no separation of church and state here. Um, the government and religion go hand in hand. And so when you have minority religious groups, they often get persecuted within these countries. Um, and so you have, you know, widespread uh, witch trials that kind of sweep across Europe. We, we are much more familiar with the Salem witch trials in, in America, but before this happens in America, you have massive witch trials and scandals that kind of sweep across northern Europe. Um, in the south and in the west, you're going to have inquisitions, you know, trying to find heretics. You know, so the famous one is the Spanish Inquisition where they're trying to root out Protestants and Jews uh, from Spain. We also have an Italian Inquisition. We have Inquisitions in Northern Europe trying to find Catholics. Um, so it's a very tumultuous situation. And for a lot of Americans, it's, it's hard to understand because we come from a tradition of freedom of religion. But there is no real understanding of freedom of religion in a lot of these countries. And so you have to understand these two principles about religion and European society. One, that they are extremely religious, and two, that they're, for the most part they're very unaccepting of other people's viewpoints. So that's the first big thing, that's kind of foundation of European society. Christianity, they're founded in a Christian society um, with all of those values that go along with it. Second big thing is they come from this legacy of a feudal society. So. By this point, by the 1500s, 1600s, feudalism is really, it's gone for the most part in Western Europe. But the legacy of it is still there. And the big legacy that you want to understand here is the understanding of social classes. So there's really two big social classes in the feudal society. You have 
the nobility, and then everybody else, the peasants, right? So the nobility are the knights and the lords. Peasants were the old serfs, anybody who was doing kind of common labor. Now, there are big differences as far as rights are concerned for a, for a no, noble person and for a common person. Um, the nobility, for example, are allowed to hunt. They're allowed to own weapons. They're allowed to learn to fight. Um, the, a regular person, a common person, uh, a peasant, can't do any of those things. Um, they're not allowed to fight. They're not allowed to own weapons. Um, nobility own land. Regular people do not own land. They rent land, um, their property of the nobility. Um, so the Europeans are coming from this mindset where only certain people have certain rights. Um, and so you have to keep that in context when you understand how revolutionary American society really is when you first kind of set this, set this uh, whole society up. Very, very different from the culture that they're coming from. Uh, the other big thing here as far as social classes are concerned is that nobility don't do work. They don't have jobs. We think people, rich people, wealthy people, they have a job, they go out, they have a profession. These people do not have a job, not a profession. They make money off of owning stuff, owning land. Um, and collecting rent. So they don't have a physical job. And doing physical labor is kind of seen as beneath them. They don't do stuff like that. The regular people, of course, they do all types of jobs and they do a ton of physical labor. That's kind of what separates them as classes. Now, as far as gender roles are concerned, what you want to understand here about European society as far as your viewpoint of men and women. It's a patriarchal society, a male-dominated society. Um, so men kind of hold the powerful positions, government, army, um, which is common for most societies in the world, almost all societies in the world. Um, but kind of beyond that, as far as uh, kind of women, um, women, as far as the noble classes are concerned, women don't really do much of anything. They're kind of seen as like these delicate creatures that you know, are not fit to kind of do um, any type of work. As far as the lower class, women are going to be predominantly in the household, raising the children, um, doing all the tasks that for now in the modern society, you know, we do them very quickly. But without technology, without electricity, these things, these tasks, washing clothes and cooking take a long time. Um, and men in the lower classes predominantly will be farmers. The last big thing here that we need to kind of discuss that really kind of fuels exploration is going to be trading with the East. The big thing that the Europeans are concerned with, and this kind of is the economic context. So you have the religious, the social, this is really the economic context of coming to the New World and what's driving them. What we know is that they really want to trade predominantly with this part of the world over here. They want to trade really with Southeast Asia, the East Indies, and they're looking for the best way to get there. Now, there's problems involved with this. Um, what they really want are these goods, the spices, which have been something that Europeans have sought after for generations. Now, the problem here is that if you look at this map, what it's showing you really is that in order to kind of get these goods, what you had to do is go east, this way, through the Mediterranean Sea. So you have the Ottoman Empire here who controlled land here, and then you have the Italians who really basically controlled the Mediterranean Sea. And so if you wanted these spices, you had a, there's three people or four people involved, if you're England, say, for example. You know, when they buy it from the East Indies themselves, they're going to raise the price. When the Italians buy it from the Ottomans, they're going to raise the price, because everybody has to make their profit. And so if you're England or Spain or France or one of these countries, you're really like the fourth or fifth person to kind of touch these spices, and so the price just keeps going up and up and up. And so what they decide to do is to really kind of circumnavigate this. And so really the Portuguese are the first to try it, and then you're going to have the Spanish who kind of come behind them. And really what they're trying to do here is cut out the middleman. That's the whole idea. Um, and this is fueling a lot of exploration. This is when our famous... Uh, Christopher Columbus comes in trying to sail west across the Atlantic Ocean. He thinks the world is a lot smaller than it really is. Um, he thinks he can get there a lot quicker. But this is kind of where the whole ideology comes from, the whole mindset. Um, and so this is kind of the economic fuel as to why the English are coming, why the French are coming. Because they see the Spanish and they see the Portuguese do it in South America, and they want to kind of get involved. All right, guys, I'm running out of time, so...
हम इसके लिए 